Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Lila, and I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) (coughs) Sorry. Anything cold, I start coughing. You know, I just think I should have a cold. I'm an alcoholic, so if I'm cold and there's snow, I should be sick. I want to thank Wendy for picking me up at the airport and for being so gracious, and Alex, her son, for joining us. When she picked me up, there was this big icicle hanging off the back of her car. I thought, oh, God. You know, because, of course, I'm looking out the window of the plane thinking, these weather forecasters have no clue. There's no rain. There's no snow. There's nothing happening here. Didn't have to have a coat and a scarf and, you know, be all bundled up. And, and of course, they saw the icicle and thought, oh, interesting, this end of the country. Because, you know, each place I've been has had different weather. And it's like within 10 minutes of each other. I, I don't know how you do it up here. I walked out of the hotel, and I thought, great, I'm not going to ruin the shoes. And I get up here, like, minutes away, and, you know, I can barely walk on the sidewalk without thinking of being hospitalized. <laughs> anyway. So, it takes me a minute to get started. You know, um, the longer I'm sober, the quieter I get slower I get. Oh, it helps to be chronologically getting older, too, trust me. Every gray hair slows you down a little bit, doesn't it? You can color it, but it doesn't make a bit of difference, so just give up. And just be who you are. <clears throat> okay, the formalities. I got sober in, uh, on October 1st, 1969, in Los Angeles, California. I am humbled by the length of the sobriety that I have. It's more important to me now today than it was then because um, I know what it feels like to be sober. I also know what it feels like to survive absolutely everything that sober people survive. I know what it's like to have every one of the uh, slogans actually become experiences rather than just things I read or things I had knowledge about, or things I heard about, or things I wondered about, to have them actually come true and occur in my life. I know a few things. I've known them since the day that I got sober. Well, not exactly that day. You know, when I, when I got sober in 1969, there weren't a lot of um, rehabilitation places, you know, and, uh, oh, I'm sure they were there, but, you know, they weren't the preponderance of them that there are today. Uh, so most of us, uh, we just staggered into the meeting. Um, it was not uncommon, of course, to have DTs in the meetings. And, and I, I had my best TT sober as a judge in the first three or four days of my sobriety, sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, it was unbelievable what was going on. And um, I was stark raving mad. So, you know, everything that I imagined... You know, as long as you're sober, your story sort of changes. You know what it is? I mean, you just, you just refine it. What the bottom line on the whole thing was, hey, it was, it beats lying. You know what I mean? I mean, I've heard actually people that I got sober with, and years later they're telling, I think, wait a minute, you forgot. I was in the meeting. Uh, you actually spent your first night on my couch. Either the story you told then and the story you told now, but hey, hey what the hell? way beyond caring what people say. I'm more interested in whether or not they show up at meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis, because that's the nature of who I am. I could care less about the personalities. I'm more interested in the principles. The traditions are more important to me now than they have ever been. However, fighting about them is less important. I have finally stayed sober long enough to know that AA is going to survive all of us, all of our opinions, all of our personalities, all of our types of groups, all of our nonsense. All of our how to do it, how not to do it, the only way to do it. You know, the great thing about staying sober in Alcoholics Anonymous is you've got to survive your first few days. And then you have to survive your first year. 
you know, people say, oh, how can you stand that uh, blah, 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 those phone calls? I said, you know something? In your first year, I don't care. You can get away with bloody anything. Anything. Because if I wasn't allowed to get away with anything, and if I wasn't loved in Alcoholics Anonymous because of anything I did or didn't do, I oh God, I wouldn't have made it. And then, you know, there was a, it was kind of a different, a, a different thing. We, you know, we sweat green in the meetings. We had hallucinations. Uh, you know, when I came and I sat in the front row, I, I didn't know what the importance of that row was. It was a front row for people that were new, you know. I didn't even know how they knew I was new because I got dressed to go to the meeting so no one would think I was an alcoholic. <laughs> That's why you drive around Huntington Park in downtown Los Angeles, you know, and on a weekend night just out for a good time and happen to come into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then they wonder, you wonder, how do they know that I, you know. And then I was greeted, you know, the most famous people in AA to me are the most important people are the greeters. You know, they're the first ones we see. Little do we know that when we're sober a while, we realize that we should be greeting all of the time, even outside of the AA meetings, because, you know, God forbids, you know, You've been a real jerk in the supermarket, and the next thing you know, that newcomer walks right into the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, finds out that you think you're like the second coming of Christ, and you've been an idiot in the market. So, you know, you really have to learn to, like, you know, transfer it out there. <laughs> it's happened to me. <laughs> it was with a waitress. I was just... Honest to God, 25 years sober it was the most one of the most remorseful moments I ever had when I realized that you can cause spiritual harm by being a jerk by the way you look at somebody. So when I joined Alcoholics Anonymous, it was no different than today. Everyone was uh, allowed in, absolutely everyone, and no one was ever excluded. They'd already made all those mistakes just before that. I saw the letter that was written by a group of people in Los Angeles telling a woman she was no longer uh, going to be allowed to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, do we know if she ever came back? I sincerely doubt it. So I come from that old school that um, you're better off in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't care if you're drunk or sober, preferably. You, you know, you are sober, but if you're not and you're drinking, you're drinking right now, I'm just I'm glad you're here. You've got a chance if you're in the rooms. You have no chance if you're not around us at all. So I'm really delighted. I mean, you know, more and more and more because AA has changed. I don't know what's changed. There's just so many and so much going on and so many things. I, I don't know how people stay sober anymore. I mean, Half the stuff they come in and talk about, it sounds like jewelry to me and crystals. And I don't get it, you know. I, I, it's, it's almost impossible. And I know that if I were drinking now, that if my sobriety date wasn't when it was, that if it was like in the year 2000 and something, or maybe 1990-something, that I would be have a completely different story. I mean, I would be drinking, of course, because the nature of who I am as an alcoholic. That I require. But, you know, trust me, if there was no alcohol around, and even if there was, and I could get there faster, slow down, speed up, I would be taking whatever it was necessary to take. I don't know how people make it. It's It's got to be harder. It's got to be harder because, you know, when I came in, I was I was physically gone. I was one of those really, really fortunate people that at a very, very young age, it's no longer relevant what that is, but at a very, very... <laughs> just do the math, you know, couldn't be far off. But anyway, um, at a very, very young age, I was poisoned. I poisoned I, the allergy to alcohol. The first part of the problem that we have as alcoholics is our physical problem with alcohol. I had a problem with it, and, and it, uh, you know, it affected my left leg, and I was dragging the thing, and I couldn't move on one side of my body. And, you know, that's what came down those steps into that meeting in, in California. I was just physically gone. Now, the good news is that wouldn't have been enough for me. Do you think I cared that I was even going to die? I was trying to die, for God's sake, you know? I was trying to die. Alcoholism, in my opinion, is just social acceptable suicide a day at a time. That's all. You know, we're trying. We're really trying. But I had the other component. You know, I had this emotional mess of a life. I thought I had it all together. I had nothing together. I thought I had money. I didn't have money. But on the second or the third drink, 
I thought I had all these things, you know? When I wasn't drinking, I was fearful. When I was drinking, I was in fantasy. There was no reality. I didn't want anything to do with reality. Reality either was like, I'm afraid and I'm terrified and I can't live in this planet one more bloody day, or drink three, drink four, woof, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a thinker, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm <laughs> dying from potential faster than alcoholism, you know. <laughs> I didn't do any drugs, really, to speak of. I mean, it was embarrassing. I mean, a little hashish on the marijuana thing, and that was enough to take me into hallucinations. And I used to, you know, drink and smoke this stuff every now and then. Whenever it was time to pay the bills, and then, you know, I'm sober a few weeks, a month or two, and I find the bills in a shoebox in the closet. Didn't pay any of them, you know. Came into Alcoholics Anonymous, like most people, during those days, and like that are like me. Nothing. Anybody that was in my life, they were alcoholics. I don't want to have anything to do with people that were not alcoholics. Why would I bother? You know, what was that about? Why would you want to be friends with somebody that wasn't an alcoholic? A non-drinker. These weirdos that see to your soul. Whoa. <laughs> Come on. In fact, I was a dangerous alcoholic. If you came into my house and you didn't drink, oh, I would make sure you did. Even if I had to, like, you know, slip it in there somehow. <laughs> Trust me, it helps when you're sober and a recovering member of Alcoholics Anonymous to have been one of those. Because I'm very cautious about absolutely everything and everybody because I know what I was like. I had no relationships. I had everything was broken. I had no emotional balance of any kind. I really didn't. And uh, so that was the second component. So you can only imagine that on the way over there, I thought, well, you know, like, i got to figure this alcoholic thing out. I, I, I know, I mean, I come from Ireland, A, qualified. <laughs> First box, second box, ten boxes, Irish, done. Even in the restaurant today when we went for a little bite, uh, I said to the woman, look, just burn everything. You know, just burn the eggs, just burn them. And just tell the cook, you know, I'm Irish, and when they're crying, I'm happy. <laughs> and she said, oh, you must drink or something. I thought, oh, Jesus, you just meant Irish drink. <laughs> my father was an alcoholic. My mother was the Blessed Virgin Reincarnate. <laughs> they had five children in Ireland. One of them, I was the first child in Toronto, Canada, and a child in the United States of America named Gerard Kennedy. You can tell what year we came to the United States of America, if you know anything about your history here. Anyway, out of that family, uh, I have a brother and a sister who are uh, across the mist, as they say, as a direct result of the disease of alcoholism. doesn't matter what you put on the death certificate, we know. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, the, as the Irish fairy princess used to say, you know, raise your hand, part the mist, and there they are. So they are now my greatest confidants and my best spiritual strength comes from my family. Uh, my father was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the beginning people in AA. In Ireland, went to Canada, blah, 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 blah. Big personality, my father. Wonderful communicator, brilliant, really, smart guy, sick. Uh, by the time we arrived in the United States, um, we came from that old school. They existed then even in AA, where, you know, we are alcoholics. We are not addicts, we are alcoholics. So consequently, if we have a little of this and a little of that, or we experiment with LSD, or we have a little marijuana going around the block outside the Lark Annal meeting in West Covina, California, well, you know, that's not a problem for us, you see, because we only have drinking problems. My father died at, uh, in 2005 from medical problem, and also on his death certificate, it states cirrhosis of the liver. So, there you go. Ah, my mother, she barely had a drink at all. The only alcohol my mother had anything to do with was the brandy for the priests. 
My mother died um, a couple of years ago. I miss her. I miss her so very much. So there it is. The non-drinker. The drinkers. I have a brother in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have another brother that doesn't drink at all because when he does, he can't control it. So he doesn't drink at all. One of those. Good for him. I don't care how you stay sober. It wouldn't work for me. It works for him. Good for him. And I have a sister, one left, who's a member of Al-Anon. So we've completed the whole cycle. <laughs> she might need a drink every now and then. <laughs> uh, actually, now that we've lost our parents and all of this has happened, and we, uh, we have a tremendously, a really good relationship. You know, I just described, I think, the disease of alcoholism. So there's the emotional thing. You can imagine what was going on if I was the first one of the sibling, my siblings and, and the children in that family, to get sober. So emotionally, it wasn't really very good. And the third component that I now know for a fact for me that every one of us needs is that spiritual bankruptcy inside. Because, you see, dying wasn't enough. I don't care about the emotional thing. You'd think I cared, really. Do you think if I cared, I drove and killed you? Do you think that mattered to me? Do you think showing me livers that were going to like fall out of your left side of your body? Do you think that that mattered? Do you think anything like that mattered? Do you think wreckage mattered? No, because a drink or two or three, I didn't think about that. I had an escape. I had a solution. Um, I really believe that if I wasn't drinking, I, I would have gone stark raving mad. I used to consider uh, drinking the, the, the answer. It was my solution. It wasn't a problem. Oh, it became a bit of a problem when you lose things like cars and people and stuff, you know, and <laughs> money. And But, you know, so what? It wasn't that big a problem. It wasn't a problem until it stopped working. It wasn't a problem until I turned around one night on my couch by myself because I reached a point as progressive as it is. Alcoholism is a progressive disease. It just is. In any way, shape, or form, it is. So I progressed to my couch with the, you know, sitting there with my bottles of scotch and, oh, I think. And it wouldn't work. I poured drink after drink, and I couldn't get drunk. So I did exactly what it's recommended in Alcoholics Anonymous to do. I tried other things. I got brandy, you know. I don't want to work for the priest. It worked for me when I was a kid. I'm going to have to work again. And it didn't work. And oh God, that clarity of mind. When whatever it is, that dying spirit inside of you is about to go now. Because now I know what it means. I didn't know for the longest time what it meant. But now I know what it means. It means that even me, the spirit in me, was pushing forth so much that it overrode the power of alcohol and said, for God's sake, we're giving you a clear moment so you can see, so you can feel, so you can sense the desperation that's inside of you. I was so sick and tired on that couch that I didn't have the strength to kill myself, let alone the desire. I was done, done. I was tired. Oh, I had pretty words for it a lot of times, lots of talks all over the place. You know what? I was tired. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't get up one more day, go out there, shake one more hand. How are you? Have a nice day. Who cares? I could have cared less if you all blew up. I wasn't going out anyway. Didn't make any difference to me. It was over. To a series of things. You know how it is. Everybody has their little coincidences, you know, those uh, divine order of things, those invisible things that happen to you, those coincidences that the longer you're sober, the more important they are, the more you recognize them. That's all there is in life, by the way, the divine order of things, recognizing it and going, wow, you know, you know, uh, it's fantastic. And, you know, I look back and I think, look at that. Somebody came and asked me to help another alcoholic. Can you imagine? <laughs> Of course, I knew all about AA, so I could. I could call up this guy, George, on a Saturday morning and say, Hey, George, 
you don't know me, but I know all about you and AA and this woman and blah, 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 blah. So we got her all sorted out, and uh, he said to me, hold on a minute now, uh, what about you? I said, what the hell? What about me? The hell is this guy? What about me? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you're drinking now, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, well, alcoholics drink in the morning. I said, I don't drink in the morning. It's a weekend. They're not mornings. <laughs> Well, can you pour that out? I said, of course I can pour it out. Okay, I'll wait, he says. You know, and now those days it was a little harder. The phone was stationary. <laughs> you know, I went over there, blah, blah, blah. And he said a few more things, and I don't know what I said, but I knew. You know, because so, we get in there. That's what sober people are supposed to do. That's what members of AA are supposed to do. That's the message you're supposed to carry. To people that are not in recovery, you carry that message. You plant that little seed that there's hope, that there's another place, that there's somewhere to go, that maybe you have the disease, that maybe there's something wrong with you, for God's sake. And when you're sober, you carry the same little seed of hope, of hope, no matter who that person is, especially if they drank and they came back, especially if they drank. They're doing what alcoholics do, for God's sake. Never reject them. I am so sick and tired of hearing stories in Alcoholics Anonymous about, oh, if you do this, but please. When I got sober, they slammed their fist on the table and said, you can't drink again. Whoa, don't scare the newcomer. Scared me, I'm telling you. You can't drink again, no matter what. No matter what. I knew if my mother died, I'd drink again. I could hear the bagpipes then. That was 42 years ago. I was waiting for that. That was going to be big. Oh, of course. Ah, and as they died in Ireland, I would drink. And if you went here, you would drink. And if you went there, you would drink. And as soon as I got the first million dollars, I would drink. Thank God I never left Alcoholics Anonymous, so I didn't have to do all of that. Because the guy said to me, you cannot drink again for the rest of your life. Now, how you do it is a day at a time, and don't argue with me about it afterwards. Talk to your sponsor, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, you know, that's the drill, really, isn't it? If you're sitting out there and you have any reservation whatsoever, you know, the little thing in italics tipped over in the book a little bit there, just in case you go too fast, they make you tip. Catch that one. Woof. Any reservation whatsoever. And when I got there, I was physically, emotionally, and spiritually bankrupt. I knew it. I knew there was nowhere else to go. And I knew that I could not drink again for the rest of my life. And that if I didn't hang around those meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would. And I was absolutely shaken. I had no intention of staying anyway, don't misunderstand. Because I'm an alcoholic, a newcomer, and I'm telling myself, you're out of here in three weeks. You're going to be great. Things are going to be good. Back in the saddle, just a matter of time. <laughs> you know, you're strong, you're Irish, you'll kick back, you'll be fine. That's why when people are new and they say they're fine, everything's great, I think, oh, you're in such trouble. <laughs> you know, when they're calling up and they're going to kill themselves and shoot themselves or shoot somebody else or they're nuts or whatever's going on with them, they go, oh, yeah, this is great. You're supposed to feel all that. What do you think happens to all that stuff that emotionally has never been dealt with? has been pressed down, watered down, drunk down, gone. And suddenly you're out there in reality. It's like, whoa, come on. They're supposed to be nuts. And by the way, I have an opinion. <laughs> whoa. Uh, when people are too healthy in AA, there's something wrong with them too. When they're perfect in Alcoholics Anonymous, run the other way. <laughs> Go find yourself someone that's fallen down, gotten up a few times. Now, the trick is that's fallen down, gotten up, did drink. As you're aging, get people that have gotten sick. Find a few people who've had people die around them. 
If you're the mid years of your life and things are tough as they are in the world these days, find some people that have lost jobs, had jobs, big jobs, small jobs, all kinds of jobs. A is marvelous. They used to tell me things at the beginning like if you read too fast, read slow. If you read too slow, read faster for Christ's sake. Have you read the big book? Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you start at the first page? Oh. I can't stand the stories at the beginning, like Dr. Bob and Dr. He said, I don't care. Someday you will identify with those stories. So read them again, but read it from the table of contents. That's where it starts, at the forward with the little X's and the Roman numeral things. Back there, first page, right to the 164th page. Stories are fun. We used to have better stories, by the way, when I got sober. <laughs> we could tell you stuff, you know, coming to get us, what we did, people robbed banks. It was great. Now you're blasted all over the Internet. <clears throat> so a little scary about stuff like that. Alcoholics won't tell anybody. <laughs> right. Jesus. Can't wait for all those tapes from the 90s to disappear. <laughs> I'm trying to fill them up with new ones. <clears throat> What's this all about? That they told me I couldn't drink again. They also told me that I had to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for the rest of my life. And that I was the kind of alcoholic that needed to do that. Because if I didn't, I would forget. Did I ever give you that opinion? Because I forget what it was now. Oh, well. I also know that I have never met anyone that has been sober, that has gone out to drink, that continued to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, I met a couple of people that were in the meetings, but they weren't present. I don't believe anybody just drinks. And that was my big thing. You know, when I was first sober, I thought, oh, my God, no defense. What are we going to do? A bottle of scotch is going to come out of the sky, hit my elbow, flip up, go down my throat. I'm done. And a guy drags me in the back room and explains the insurance policy and Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sure you've all heard it. You know, every meeting is a little chip and, uh, you know, whatever. And, and you got to go to these meetings, and the more you build up and the more you come around AA members, I mean, the more you get this thing, and then, you know, that's your defense. First year, five years, that is your defense. The fellowship is your defense. The meetings are your defense. The hanging out together is your defense. The struggling with the other people, just like you, is the defense. All the guys in the front row are the defense. By the way, the front row was a seizure row. I was in the seizure row. Can you imagine? They put you in a seizure row. Woof. I didn't know that. <laughs> I think I'm getting a cold because I'm in Seattle. Can you imagine if I'd known it was a seizure row? However, I found out when the guy beside me, like, flopped over. They came out. They grabbed him by the legs. They took him back. And Ten minutes later, he's back. <laughs> that was my spiritual experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. It kept me sober for 42 years. I can tell you that. It wasn't like God came out of the sky and said, this one's our little sunbeam. We're going to save this one. But no, no, no. The guy had a seizure. I went, wow. Wow. And, you know, and then you hear stories and you go, wow. And you hear people talk about the hollowness inside and you go, wow. And then they talk about how frightened they were and how lonely they were and how desperate they were and how they couldn't live like that anymore and how tired they were and how it was just over. You go, Wow. Well, you know, that's why we come to meetings, because it never gets old. It never gets boring. I am never, at, well, okay, that's not true. They say if you haven't been at least to a couple of bad meetings, you haven't been to enough. You know what I mean? So, but I have never been to a meeting that I've found it necessary to leave. And I have never been to a meeting that I have not listened. I have learned to listen. In fact, I was telling somebody in the car on the way over that if I was hooked up to a bunch of, you know, electrical things, brain and everything, probably the calmest and the most peaceful and the most at ease I am is in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And now I take advantage of that by going to meetings to actually calm down and enjoy it. And I listen. I really listen. I listen because I like people more and I care. It took a long time. In the first five years, I used to go into meetings with an imaginary Uzi, a big, huge gun, you know. <laughs> Sit in the back of the room. 
depending on the meeting, depending on my mood, depending on the night. Blow all the redheads' heads right off. <laughs> Ball guys the next night. You know, it didn't matter. Resented if somebody showed up that I had killed, you know, the week before. That's what I was thinking about. So I know that if you just show up, if you're just going to the meetings, if you're just sort of absorbing the spirit, the language, the silent language of Alcoholics Anonymous, you're getting it. It's coming in your pores. I thought that the first thing that got handled was the physical thing. Because, you know, I cleaned up the car, I, my leg kind of took a while, but, you know, <laughs> every now and then, even now, I get a pain in my left leg and I think, whoa, <laughs> you know, never forget. Uh, and that, so I cleaned up myself physically, got a little get going. I thought, wow, that really is great. First I was physically well, and, and then things kind of emotionally got balanced because I didn't do anything. Everybody just said to me, don't do anything. Don't make any decisions. Don't make any decisions about anything. And I thought, well, that's no different than what I've been doing for the last two years, but that's fine. Turn it over, turn it over, turn it over, turn it over, turn it over. And I thought, this is fine. Turn it over, turn it over. Everybody, all those newcomers were turning it over. And then one day we tried to figure out who were we giving it to? Who's catching it? What's going to happen? When is it coming back? Now, you know, I realized from Carol, I'll never forget her, Carol, she said, Chuck, I said, oh, my God, it's like I'm sober, I'm not so sure anymore, like things are like backing up on me here, I'm crazy, but she said, oh, finally, you're getting well. <laughs> this is the best you have ever been. God, I've had reason to say that to people over the years. I actually have a little tremor when I say it to them, but it's true. My whole life just blew up. My car blew up. My kids blew up. My house blew up. Everything blew up. Oh, this is the best place you could ever... Like, why don't they just shoot us? <laughs> now at least I qualify it with, you know what? You got to cry and you got to hurt. And for God's sake, don't deny the feelings. And it's a terrible thing. Terrible things happen to really good people. Terrible things happen to members of Alcoholics Anonymous who are really good people. It has nothing to do with how they're working the program. It has everything to do with life. And for me, it has everything to do with my personal experience and how I perceive my life. And that's the greatest change that has occurred. Because after I got physically well and thought that was really great and I kind of got a little emotional balance and got it all back on, I, then I thought, well, I'm going to work on the spiritual thing. So I have spent 20 or 30 years working on the spiritual thing. <laughs> it was the first thing to work the day I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, the spiritual thing was working when I was drunk on the bathroom floor, was unconscious, started to come out of a blackout, reached the mirror, you know, they spin up and down those mirrors, and I found myself saying, God, help me. On that bathroom floor, God, help me. And I was enraged that I had asked God for help enraged because I didn't want God's help. God had done nothing for me. I was certainly not interested in God's help or anyone else's help for that matter. It was not long after that that I was an Alcoholics Anonymous. Wondering, is there really a God? Is there really somebody that can help me? I still didn't believe it, but all those other people seemed to have it all going on. I tried, you know. We'd be going down that freeway, and I'd turn on this country and western music, you know, and <sighs> drop kick me Jesus through the goalposts of life. Wow, that's very cool. And then one day they sang the serenity prayer. I couldn't believe it. Well, no, I'm singing the serenity prayer, and I'm singing Drop Kick Me Jesus to the Gold Coast of Life. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Jesus said, it's time. Drop kicker right through those goal posts. <laughs> I tried everything. Seeking, 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 looking, looking, looking. That's what you're supposed to do. I tried everything emotionally, all the therapy, all the names. God, they have all the same crap now. They just call it something different, charge you more. <laughs> It took until I was very long along the way. A couple of years ago when my mother was dying, I really got it. 
I got it. I got what it was about this death, that. I understood something about my sister dying and my mother and all of them. And they're all gone now. Jane's mother and father have died. All of my relatives of my generation in Ireland have died. Got cousins and things, but you know. I lost the guy that put me in the front row. I lost the people in the back room after I got out of the front row and got some sobriety under my belt. Began to put money, property, prestige, power, and prestige and bullshit in front of my own perceived image of God. They love me anyway in that back room as they watch me become a narcissistic, driven, money-hungry, greedy person. Hey, I don't mind. Worked. That's what kept me going at the time. I have no judgment on myself anymore. There is not one thing that has happened to me that has been a mistake. I believe in that divine order of things. That's why I so understand so much of the nonsense, even in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've done it. Oh, God, I used to judge so severely. <sighs> you know, an old guy told me once that if you judge, it'll happen to you. It's true. Oh, it may not look exactly the same. But one day you'll wake up and think, Jesus, and you'll stop. The great benefit of staying sober, working the steps and finding the spiritual way of life, the great, great thing, and the most painful and the worst thing, is you can't blame anybody anymore. Because you see, when they told me, at the beginning, that I had to stay sober for the rest of my life and go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for the rest of my life. They told me that I'd read the big book for the rest of my life and that that would be followed up with the 12 and 12 and that I had to find God and that I would be seeking that God for the rest of my life. That part has changed. I'm not seeking any more. Oh, God, I looked. I now know that I had somebody, something that understood me, that got me when I was on that bathroom floor. Bunch of little leprechauns, angels, God knows what, that said to one another, I think, I think it's time. I think we better set up a little series of events here, perhaps now. We don't want to interfere in her destiny, but let's just bump her into Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And I didn't know then that that was God. And when I wanted to leave Alcoholics Anonymous because I was well, and I'd had it, and I was okay, and when I was driving down that street to that meeting in the middle of the night, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just, you know, they pound it into your head. They pound it into your head. Call somebody before you drink. Which, by the way, in the year 2000, whatever the hell we're in, 12, that's almost impossible not to do now. You can text them, Twitter them, tweak them. You can do a million things before you drink. I mean, we had to find a phone booth. <laughs> it was a challenge, and we had to have a dime. It was a dime, and we always had to carry a dime in our pocket. Bananas in the car because, you know, your sugar and everything was all wacky, and you had to eat. Couldn't call these people unless you had eaten. I'll never forget the guy that called me. I'm dying. I'm going to kill myself. And blah, blah, blah. I said, have you had lunch? Have you eaten? <laughs> When's the last time you ate something? Well, I, I'm, I, I'm, 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 can't you understand? I'm like an emotional basket case. I said, go eat a sandwich and call me back. <laughs> Christ, by the time he called me back, he wasn't going to kill himself. A sandwich. <laughs> Not therapy, a sandwich. <laughs> Next time you're having a fit, eat a banana. That's what the guy told me. I'm going to call them up in the middle of the night. Because, you know, they used to say you can call us any time. <laughs> They're right. I'm going to call you. Because I'm leaving. Call you any time. Oh, that meeting that I went to that night, by the way, I only went to it because I was afraid not to go to it because these idiots had told me that I had to go and, you know, like make an attempt to call them or do something. 
Anyway, to make a long story short, the glove compartment pops open. Out comes the directory, which, you know, that was the other rule. We don't have rules in AA. We don't have any rules, right? Don't drink. Go to meetings. Read the big book. Get a sponsor. Put out the C, blah, 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 blah. We used to have other rules. Make sure you have a directory and an a, a big book in your car all the time. All the goddamn time. I still do. Jane has one in her car. And believe it or not, I had just been thinking, so, you know, I think I'll put this stuff over there. And let's just move this stuff because i got to clean out the trunk, you know. And sh- we're at a meeting. And they don't have any literature because the literature, God knows. They gave the assignment to somebody who was sober 22 minutes. Anyway, that's the end of the literature. (laughs) He'll be back, though. He'll be back. You know, I love that they gave him the literature. He's going to be guilty over that damn literature. It'll bring him right back. I can't wait to see him. You know, if I, what was it, the literature? And he'll say, that damn literature was haunting me from the back. Anyway. And sure enough, here's the guy in his first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Not his first time back, not his millionth time. His first meeting, never been to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. My God, it was so exciting. We were able to go to the car, we had a directory, we had a big book, I'm off. Anyway, so that was part of the rules that we had then, that we had to have a directory in the car. So that directory popped out and I thought, I am not going to drink in this place I had picked out, by the way. You know, one of those one light bulb places. And I'm not going to go in there and drink and have you ruin my drinking. So, no, all the money, throw it in the, back, in the seat of the car, and I'm going to know. And the, and the glove compartment pops open. You don't think there's something happening when your glove compartment pops open by itself? And the A director just slips right out. But that doesn't matter to me, because I think it's 1 o'clock in the morning. The city of Los Angeles, some dark place in town, i got to tell you, there are no meetings at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm new enough to know that. We used to name the meetings then, you know, they had not as many as they do now, and it was called, um, the, I looked in the book, and there was a meeting, it was 1 o'clock in the morning, it was called, It's Never Too Late. <laughs> that will shake you up, really. It'll shake you up. <laughs> anyway, it's a story unto itself, how that, and that was a big moment, you know, of wow. You know, a wow. And I have had a number of those. Uh, when we found my sister uh, uh, dead and um, uh, Jane rushed home and uh, she was giving a, a dead person mouth-to-mouth resuscitation because we were so desperate to save her life and, and, and all of that was going on. And, you know, you get through that and uh, you get through it in the most extraordinary ways and, and things happen. And, uh, you know, I lost jobs and I got jobs and... And, and things sort of evened out. And, um, and the only thing that I did all the same all along was I went to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I believe that, that there, there, while I didn't understand it, that there was some spiritual thing happening. And then I would have a bunch of these moments where like, how did that happen? How did it happen that so-and-so met so-and-so that met so-and-so? And I changed completely. And I went into a field where I made a ton of money. And then I retired at 45 years of age because I did, couldn't do it anymore. Oh, I could have. I didn't want to. I had the choice. Extraordinary. I was always going back, you know, because because I was. But I never went back. I went to Ireland, and I cried. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried, and I never went back. It was 20 years ago this year that I never went back. Imagine. I would never have been able to tell you how all that works if all these little events hadn't occurred. And so spiritually, before I got sober, and all through my sobriety, and all through my first year of complete craziness, I mean, for like three months I lived in my apartment at the beginning of my sobriety, in the living room with all the lights on and all the furniture facing the door because they were coming to get me. The jackhammers coming through the wall. Now that's how I was when I got sober. And then a year goes by, and then five years go by, and then I went through the wreckage of people and had some relationships and, you know, fantasy relationships, recreated the family you never have. I mean, all the things. It's so textbooks what we do. We think it's all dramatic and interesting because it's us, but really, if you hear enough stories as I have and tell enough of your own, you know, pretty boring stuff, really. 
You know, we're like a big reality show all the time in AA. <laughs> I can honestly say that in the f- maybe in the first 15 years or so, I was hit and miss on the steps. You know, of course, I worked them. I had a sponsor because, you know, I do things right and, and all of that. And um, But, you know, I was kind of like picking pick and choosing. You know what I mean? It was like it was a pleasant little thing I had going. I mean, I had enough money to not be stressed. And, you know, people adored me and I was beautiful. And, I mean, whatever. You know, you have all that stuff going for you. You can either turn out to be a complete, timid little victim or you can be like me and think you're just some gorgeous thing and, you know, whatever. I mean, we do. We all suffer from where it's not enough. I'll never be enough. I can never have enough. I filled it up with outside things. Other people just wither in their bedroom. I think I, you know, prefer my way. But what the hell? Worked for me, you know? It worked for me. It was my destiny. So I, I, I finally knew that with all this stuff that I had on the outside, you know, and all going on, I wondered why it wasn't working. How come I knew all these guys that had all this peace sitting in that room back the kitchen in the back of that meeting, sitting there just looking at us all? How come they had this thing in their eyes, this peace? Why is it that Carol had a peace in her eye? Why is it that they had this sense of calm? I didn't have it. I'm rushing toward 20, and I don't have it. 18, 15, whatever. And I got it. I got it. I got it that I was full of knowledge. And that the few experiences I had in these few little coincidences were enough to keep me going because I live on hope. That's my drink. That's my addiction, this hope. I breathe hope. Without hope, I might as well just go away. I would, but I don't. I I love hope. So I, I just couldn't understand. And you know what I had to do? It wasn't enough for me. Well, I went to the meetings because I, I don't know how not to go to the meetings. I also went to the meetings because I know, I know that if I drink again, I'll make the decision just like you. I'll make that decision stone cold sober. It'll be a sober decision. And even if I'm sitting in those meetings, unless I'm paying attention, I will drift away. And then I kind of won't go, and I won't go, and I won't go as many times, and I'll complain about this meeting and that meeting, and instead of doing something in the solution-oriented way that is our nature, I will go back to being dark and negative. So it happens to people like me. If I don't stay tuned in, I just have to. But, oh, God, it was a deep thing coming from inside of me. It was the entire feeling of I am tired again with a loneliness that was more desperate than when I joined Alcoholics Anonymous and I was in a relationship. And I was lonelier than I have ever been, ever. And I knew less, and it wasn't enough. And I was sober and I was considered an outstanding member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I wasn't telling the truth in the meetings. Because I wasn't speaking about it. I don't want to infect the and, and, and hurt the newcomer because I'm like almost 20 years sober, and I messed up. I'm uncomfortable. I don't like AA anymore. What the hell am I going to do? Do you have that happen to you? Because this happens. I'm not a newcomer. I'm not an old-timer. I'm just a comer. Whoa. Horrible. Just there, doing the day, persevering along, struggling, not struggling, sick, not sick, up, down, staying sober because I know I have to. I know I'm an alcoholic. For God's sake, it's the one thing I know in life. I can't drink. But, oh, God, I was desperate. I was horribly empty. I had to start all over again. I had to read the book from the table of contents. And this time I didn't read it as a drunk. I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I found the sober person in the book. I found the sober Bill Wilson telling you what it was like so you could tell the newcomer. But I found unidentified with the sobriety. Oh, yes, I saw the guy, the jaywalker, flying in front of buses all the time. I was still doing it. I had a laugh. I had a laugh. I thought, there I am. And I found myself. And I stopped listening to everything that everybody told me. And I found the 
two or three people that had a real positive relationship with the steps that talked about them and talked about their feelings. And then I knew, knew, small select group. And I started to work those steps like only the dying can. Because you see, I was dying. I was spiritually dying as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And oh, God, how my life has changed. And so for the last 25 years, I have become not a student for you, nothing for you. I have become a student of the steps for me. I am the one that has to wear them like a loose garment. What do you give me? You share your experience with me. You tell me how you do it. You have your curve on it, your take on it. I think, wow, I never saw that before. That's really interesting. I've given up every idea I ever had through yesterday. I'm willing to change my mind about something I was sure about. Yesterday. Yesterday. Because I get it now, you see. You see, when my mother died, she knew me. She knew me longer than anyone else. And she got me. And I got it. They all got me. My mother got me. My grandmother got me. Everybody's got somebody that got you. They get you. They just get you. They're going to love you no matter what the hell you do to them. I mean, look what you did to them. I don't care how long you're sober. Look what you did to them. And they got you. And they always took you home. They were always there. They always made a cup of tea, and they always had a slice of toast or something for you. (sighs) Anyway, they got me. It's hard to be distracted when you're having a spiritual experience yourself, you know, and what the hell's going on back there, but hope an ambulance comes soon. Um, anyway, they got me. And then I knew it, that when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, the reason I stayed was because you got me. You see, you know I'm an alcoholic. You know the kind of alcoholic I am. I know you're alcoholics. I know what it's like to be on a bathroom floor. You know what it's like to be on a bathroom floor. I know what it's like to come off that bathroom floor. You know what it's like to come off that bathroom floor. I don't want to go back to the bathroom floor. Neither do you. So when we're in this room by ourselves, despite it all, we leave all of our stuff. If we're really, really good at it, and we really practice this program, we leave all our stuff out there in the parking lot. We leave our politics out there. We leave our opinions out there. We leave our AA stuff out there. We leave all that garbage out there, and we just bring this little empty soul in here. We say, wow, I need a plug. I need to be filled up with hope. How are you doing? And you mean it. You see, you get me. So you were my God, and I didn't even know I had you. I went looking everywhere. And I always wondered, why is it that the place I'm the calmest and the most content is in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? Perhaps it's because it is my place of heaven. It's my little moment of solitude. It's my spot in the sun in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, and when I knew that, the steps have taken on a whole new meaning. I see them as a way to live my life. When I first started working them, I did whatever my sponsor told me to do. That's what you do. That's how you learn to take direction. And then you go and, well, you don't like it? Well, change it with your sponsee. They're not going to know. And trust me, they're going to change what you tell them too because they think you're just as big as idiot as you thought the other guy was. So it just gets passed around. It all works. And nobody has the answer. Nobody has the answer. Because life is outside these rooms. And when life happens outside these rooms, no matter what you do in these rooms, life is going to happen. They will live, they will die, they will leave you, they will stay with you, you will have money, you will not have money, you will have jobs, you will not have jobs, you'll grow old, you will not grow, you know, all these things are going to happen to you. So what you learn to do in here is how to handle all those things. You don't learn to stop them. You don't learn to have opinions about other people's things. You don't know when it's going to happen for another person. Everybody's turning the barrel as their own. You just know, hey, this happened to me. I survived it. You will too. Want the details? Call me. I'm standing here. It works. And by the way, 
This is where you feel God. So the more you can come here, the more you can sit quietly, the more you can look at somebody, even the assholes. They have been my greatest challenge because I have had to say, there's got to be something that person is going to say that I can take home. Oh, it's hard. (laughs) But it's good. It opened my mind a little bit. It calms me down. Sometimes there's not, by the way. Sometimes I think, whoa, I'm so happy just to be me. (laughs) That is the biggest gift of all. So now I work the steps. I work the steps because I know that I am powerless over alcohol and that it makes my life unmanageable, but I know that I don't drink and I know that I don't want to drink. And I know that today I am not drinking and I know what to do about that today. And I know that I have to be spiritually fit every single solitary day because that's what it says. And when you get down to the 11th step, it says... What you have to do to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for as long as you want. It says you have to pray for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry it out. The power is in the meetings. The power is in the communication. And then you get to do it yourself. The day will come if you are lucky where you will be alone at 3 o'clock in the morning and you will know that you have to go home and understand those steps for you, that they are for you, that everything AA has given you is so that it will now take you to the next level within you, that when you say, I am man- I, when I am unmanageable now, it, is, it could be the smallest little thing. Sometimes I don't even know why I'm unmanageable. I just know that I am powerless over a look, a smile. It used to be big things. No, it's not anymore. It's the smallest things. But it'll throw me off. Sometimes I just wake up and I'm off. That's enough. Because if I don't get back on, I'm unmanageable. And I can use the second step to restore me. Oh, it's restored me from a bathroom floor. Why wouldn't it restore me to a good attitude? But I know that I have to go to the third step or I'm not going to get that. Because if I don't make room for that to happen, if I don't open myself up inside... It's not one more thing, one more dollar, one more car, one more piece of jewelry. It's none of that anymore. It's like it's a feeling. Oh, don't misunderstand. I am not one of those people that can bear it when people who have money say, it's great if you don't have money, it works. It's more comfortable if you have money. (laughs) What the hell is that? I am humbled by how how well I have done. And if I didn't do well tomorrow, as some catastrophe occurred in my life because it occurs in people's lives, then Jane and I would downsize and we would right-size ourselves to our position and we would be okay because we would still pay the rent. That's how we live. We live right-size. When I was a little drunken newcomer, I had nothing. I was right-sized to that. I will be right. And when I lost everything, I was right-sized to that. And now that I have something, I'm right-sized to that. And if I get more, I'll have right-sized to that. And if I get less, I'll be right-sized to that. How does that work? It works because I know I'm unmanageable if I'm not right-sized, that I have to be restored to being in balance and to be right-sized, that I have to make room for that to happen because the God, the spiritual understanding, the thing that I cannot define, the God that is less understanding to me now than ever is bigger and more paramount in my mind. For me, it's a spiritual connection with all the people that have gone on before me. I am so loved by these people. I have been so accepted when they were alive. I am accepted now that they are dead. I have an army of Irish drunks and one mother protecting me. Who could be safer? So I have to turn things over. But you know what happens with the steps in four? You have to look and get it back and say, you know, you're doing this all the time. You better take a look at that. And you go talk to somebody that will tell you the truth. And you change that behavior. Because when you have to, you have to make room for that path to clear. Because there's nobody in the way but you. Nobody can cast a shadow on my path but me. So I have to do four and I have to do five. And then I have to get to six. What magic there is in six when you accept, this is my day. This is who I am. This is what's happening. These are the facts. These are the facts. I only deal with facts now. A person who drank to never have reality from fear and fantasy that only lives in reality, that only deals with facts. Do I talk to people on the phone? I listen for the facts. What are the facts? What are the facts? Not what I think, by the way. They are not the facts. What I feel is not a fact. What are the facts? And if I have to talk to somebody about it, I will. But when I get all those facts, I say, I accept that. I accept these facts. I accept this good or bad or indifferent situation. And then I can really go to seven. Because you see, I have know the problem. 
I know that I'll be unmanageable. I know the second step will rebalance me. I know that if I make room in three and turn it over, I will, I will get an answer. I know that if I look at what my part is and talk to somebody about it, and if I can accept it, I know then that I'm ready to let it go. I'm not ready to let it go one second before that. And then when I let it go, what the hell happens after seven, eight, and nine, the steps where you're involved? Because I've never had a problem that didn't have a person attached to it. No problem ever of any kind, ever, that didn't have people. So then I have to be in balance with you, and I have to be right size with you, and I have to be with you. And I have learned to be with you, and to care for you, and to understand you, and to understand your disease and your wellness, and the, the soul sickness that we all share in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know what it's like out in the parking lot, but I know what you're like in here. I know what you're like in here. And because I have learned to know what you're like, I know what I'm like. And then I can be a 10, and I can walk around. The walk around step in the day, and I can adjust myself. Adjust myself. It's a big adjustment. I go back to the beginning, but, you know, adjust myself. And when I have that adjustment, I'm not praying to something I don't understand anymore. I'm praying to the spiritual entity of all there is. I don't understand it. I just know it's there. I feel it. It's in me. It's part of me. I worked these steps so they became a loose garment. Little did I know that they would wrap me. They would wrap my soul in such a warmth and such a gentleness. There's a kindness that comes from having a spiritual experience. There's a kindness. The same kindness is exhibited when one alcoholic talks to another. And so I can talk to these people, and I can write every day and say, Dear Great Spirit, and I put my mother's initials, you know, because there's got to be somebody sober up there that can handle it. And, you know, here's, what do I do about this? And what do I do about that? And my life is full of questions. And I'm really little, I don't need answers. They will evolve. See, the divine order of things will provide those answers. And I will notice. I will notice. Because I understand the magnitude of the 12th step of the program for Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no power. I got the power. I made room for that power. I took myself out of the way by talking to you and doing something about it. I let go of everything. I found myself able to be work with you and say on my side of the street. I position myself so that I'm even in the day. My rudder is firm in 10. I ask for help in 11, and I ask a lot of questions, and I ask for everything, no matter how small or how big it is, to be revealed to me. And then I know, I know it works. I know it works because I'm here. I know it works because I want to be here. I know it works because I need you. I know it works because the 12th step is the place where the divine order of things is revealed. It is revealed because I am a kinder, nicer person. I say thank you more. I'm nice in restaurants. I'm a good person. I like myself. I'm decent. I'm decent. Oh, I have all the defects all of us have. But you know, I'm in balance. And when I'm not, I have the steps of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have a place to come for the rest of my life where I will always know that I am welcome because there will always be one person in this room who knows me. There is one person in this room who knows that I am an alcoholic and you are an alcoholic. And just the two of us will make it work. AA will survive us all. It will survive all these personalities. It will survive everybody. It has survived. It will continue to survive because two of us will always know. Thank you for reminding me how important it is to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.